In this video, we're going to talk about the core modeling philosophy in Creo Parametric, which is design intent. So what are your goals when modeling? Are you trying to do it in the shortest amount of time? Are you trying to do it with the fewest number of mouse clicks, with the fewest number of features, or the shortest model tree? Are you trying to follow all the different rules of modeling? Or are you trying to follow the same modeling process every single time? If you're watching this video, you can probably guess that none of those different things should be your goal when modeling in Creo Parametric. And there's a great quote that I love from one of the best movies of all time, Star Trek II Wrath of Khan, where Captain Kirk tells Lieutenant Savick, you have to learn why things work on a starship. And CBS, Viacom, Paramount, please don't sue me for using that image. You have to understand how things work and why things work in Creo Parametric. And that's all about this concept called design intent. So here we have a graph and it shows the cost of change over time when you are trying to implement changes in your designs. And so we have our different life cycle states. And bottom line is, the more that time passes, the more expensive it costs to implement a change. And the initial design phase is only a small portion of the life cycle of a product. For example, when you're creating a brand new part or a brand new assembly, when you're first making it, it might be a matter of hours, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, but hopefully that product is going to be around for a long time. It might take months to develop the entire product, and then once it is released out to the public, hopefully people are using it for years and years and years. So again, the time that you're initially making that part or assembly is relatively short. We actually spend most of our time making changes to our models. So for example, during the design phase, you might have a change of requirements. And then when you go through your different peer reviews, you might have to make more changes. And then later on, they can there can be change orders, change requests, change notices. And you could get feedback from your customers during the sustaining phase. So we actually spend most of our time making changes to our models. And because of that, we want to build additional intelligence and additional information into our parts and assemblies so that when we make a change to an object like a feature or a part or an assembly, the other parts in the assemblies will update in ways that we plan for and in ways that we expect. This is design intent. We can build design intent into our models at many different levels. And in our sketches, our sketch setup, for example, what we choose as our sketch plane and our orientation reference plane, our sketch references, and our dimensioning scheme, which consists of our dimensions and our constraints, build our design intent into our sketches. In our parts, we have many different ways in which we build in design intent. For example, with the different types of features that we choose, the options that we select, for example, like our depth options, our parent-child relationships, our relations, the equations that we make, and also a module called behavioral modeling extension, which allows us to create data analysis features and feasibility and optimization features. And in the assemblies, some of the different ways in which we build our design intent include our choice for the base component, our product structure, in other words, how we organize our assemblies into sub-assemblies, the constraints and connections that define the location of our components, and the most effective way of building design intent into our assemblies is with top-down design. Let's take a look at an example of an assembly and some of the different tools that are used for building design intent in this example are notebooks and declarations from top-down design, parameters and relations, assembly constraints, and reference patterns. In this assembly in Creo Parametric, we have a plate part which has an inlet hole and then we have our reducer subassembly and it has the reducer part and it has an outlet diameter and then a pipe part attached to it 
and it has a number of different fasteners, including bolts and nuts. And I have a cross section in here applied to two of the components. And we can see that there are a set of four fasteners on the top flange and a about six fasteners on the bottom flange if I rotate the model to show that to you. In order to build our design intent into this assembly, I've used a special tool called a notebook in Creole Parametric. And a notebook is used in top-down design. It looks a lot like a drawing. And here I have a table that lists a number of different parameters. Let's go to the parameters dialog box. And here we see all the different critical parameters. And some of them are grayed out because they are driven by relations. Let's close this dialog box and go to the relations dialog box. And here I have some comments indicating that the critical parameters are the plate hole diameter, the pipe hole diameter, and the height of the reducer. And we have a number of different relations in here that computes the value of different parameters based on these critical ones. And now if I want to change the different values, let's look in here. So for the pipe hole diameter right now, it's a value of 10. Let's change that to a value of 16. And let's look for the plate hole diameter. Right now it's a value of 20. Let's change that to a value of 30. And the other critical parameter is the reducer height. Right now it's a value of 20. Let's change that to a value of 40. I will verify my relations. Everything is good. Let's close this. And let's go to the review tab and update the tables. And we have our new values in there. So for example, we have our inlet hole diameter that we changed. And we have our diameter of the outlet pipe and change the reducer height. And these other different dimensions changed based on those values. And also we increased the number of holes in the flanges in order to control the number of fasteners. So we go back over to the assembly and I will hit the regenerate button. And there you see the changes that were made to our model. You can see the obvious change in the height and the diameters got bigger and the number of fasteners increased based on the relations that we have in the layout. And so there you see how we've built design intent into our assembly with the different tools like our notebooks, our parts being declared to the notebook, our parameters, relations, the assembly constraints that move the components, and the reference patterns that automatically increase the number of instances of nuts and bolts based on the number of holes in the parts. Let's talk about some of the different questions you should ask yourself regarding design intent as you are creating your parts and your assemblies. First off, what is the purpose of that model? Make sure that you understand its form, fit, and function. And is it part of a larger system? If so, what does it do in that larger system and how does it fit into it? And when I say how does it fit into it, I mean how does it fit into it both physically and functionally? What are your critical design constraints and goals? For example, you want to figure out, hey, is it important to have a certain volume, certain size, certain weight, strength, etc., and so on. And once you identify those critical design constraints and goals, you want to translate them into Creole parametric terminology. In other words, your different part and assembly dimensions and parameters. Then you want to figure out for your parts what features will help you achieve those goals and what components, parts, and subassemblies in your product will help you achieve those goals. And probably the most important question that you want to ask yourself to identify your design intent, what changes are likely to happen in the future and how can you plan for these changes today? And then you want to figure out how you can, excuse me, how you can make your model parametric in other words, make sure that it's controlled by the critical dimensions and parameters and that when you make a change, it's propagated throughout the model the way that you want it to be. 
Also, you want to figure out how to make your model robust. In other words, you want to be able to make changes to your dimensions. You want to be able to flex your model without ending up with a cascade of regeneration failures. And also, you want to make sure that your model is flexible. In other words, you're able to implement different changes, whether you expected them or didn't expect them, without having to do something drastic like start over from scratch. I hope you enjoyed this video. For more information, please visit www.creowindchill.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.